Hi guys, Diane here, and today I am going to bring you an excerpt from Lover Come Hack. So I was thinking, here's where this all started, I was thinking about amateur sleuths and about how they all have their careers. Uh, they all know how to do something in addition to sleuthing on the side. And uh, Madison is, you know, pretty involved in her projects being an interior decorator. She doesn't just decorate, she does some demo. And in Lover Come Hack, she actually is involved in a design competition where she has to renovate an entire building. So I found an excerpt where she's taking down a non-load bearing wall and I thought we'd do our own Madison Knight how-to video where I would read you that part. But to be fair, I learned how to do this from watching YouTube videos. So if you do find yourself in need of instructions on how to take down a non-load bearing wall, may I recommend you look for the link below this video and watch an actual expert do it and don't base what you're doing completely on what Madison's doing. So. Um, there you go. So this is, I don't know exactly where in the book this is from, but it is from the second half of the book and I'm going to jump right in. There is nothing like good old fashioned physical labor to take your mind off your troubles and give you an outlet for aggression. Demolition wasn't usually part of my job. Mad for Mod was more about decorating than design. And frankly, most people who owned mid-century houses weren't looking to knock walls out of the existing floor plans. But the requirements for entry into the VIP competition were that you had to not only design and decorate, but demo. Your final entry had to be structurally different from how it started to demonstrate each team's ability to see both what was there and what wasn't. Come to think of it, that might be why preservationists tended not to enter. As good as it felt to use the sledgehammer, I knew that wasn't the proper way to bring down an interior wall. We were lucky to be working on an unoccupied building, but with fresh paint going into the remaining 11 units, there was a need to contain the dust from my destruction by hanging plastic over the doorway. There were other considerations as well. The wall wasn't a load-bearing wall. The gaping hole I'd created left fluffy pink fiberglass insulation visible on the other side of now crumbling drywall. I could grab the broken drywall pieces and tear them off with a combination of brute force and determination, but that would only create more potential problems down the line. No, this wasn't the time to go ape. I moved the six-foot ladder to the corner of the room and climbed up with a sharp utility knife in my hand. I squared the intersection of the wall and the ceiling with a horizontal line, a five-minute task that would potentially save us hours by not tearing through the joint tape. Back down to the floor. I picked up a drywall saw and slowly cut from my sledgehammer opening at waist height across the crumbling surface with the saw at an angle. Every once in a while, I felt resistance from the studs behind the drywall and shifted the angle of my drywall saw to a diagonal. This part of the job wasn't about getting down the interior structure. It was about cutting through the outer layer, like nibbling off the frozen chocolate coating to a dove bar, but leaving the ice cream and wooden popsicle stick intact for later. It took the better part of an hour, but by a process I'd first learned on a YouTube video, I pulled off the drywall, hammered the exposed nails to the side, used the reciprocating saw to cut through the center of the stud wall, and pulled the beams out as well. The hardest part of the process was prying the beams up from the floor. When I finished the demolition portion of the job, I set the tools down and set out on the first of multiple trips to the dumpster out back. On my third trip, Joni set down her paint roller and joined me. Two more trips covered the biggest of the pieces. When we went back inside, Connie ducked into the apartment across the hall and brought out an industrial vacuum. It was connected to a long electrical cord that was plugged into one of the recently painted units that still had power. I took the vacuum from her and switched it on, getting up the dust, debris, and chunks of gypsum that had dropped onto the floor. Two years ago, I'd had the idea to pull out the carpets and refinish the hardwood floors underneath. Today, I was actually happy that a deranged killer had changed up my priorities. I'd long ago learned to work on a room renovation from top to bottom, ceiling to floor, and the previous owner's team must have been instructed to do that here as well. The texture of the ceiling was freshly painted, and I'd have to drywall the new gap in the ceiling where I'd just taken down the wall, but the previous owner hadn't gotten much farther than that. The apartment-grade carpets that I'd wanted to tear out were still in place, protecting the building's original wood floors that I now had the opportunity to refinish when the rest of the room was done. Small miracle. What's the plan, Mads? Connie asked when I switched off the vacuum. Paint? No. Drywall the gap in the ceiling where I removed the stud wall, mud it, then panda paw it. When that's dry, panda what it? I pointed up at the ceiling. Panda paw. That's what we call the tool that makes the circular texture in the ceiling. Who's we? She asked, and then almost immediately answered. Oh, Hudson. Actually, Hudson calls it a slap brush. Same thing, different name. 
I first learned about it from Brad. This time, Connie was quiet. I rarely talked about Brad Turlington, the man who'd first noticed my uniquely trained mid-century modern decorator's eye, refined through years of watching the Doris Day movies my parents had gifted me every year on the birthday I shared with the actress. They died in a car crash when I was 21, and the collection of movies had gotten me through the grieving process. Over 20 years had passed since their deaths, but every time I decorated a room, I was reminded of mom and dad. The memories of Brad were less welcome. He'd been my teacher, my coworker, and my lover, until one day he wasn't. Lately, unwanted memories of Brad had been surfacing. I pushed them back down. I needed to hold on to my anger toward Brad because it was the protective device that kept me from ever allowing myself to get hurt again. And there you go. There's your excerpt from Lover Come Hack, uh, Madison Knight, Mad for Mod, Mystery Number 6. It comes out October 30th which is like less than three weeks away. So I hope you are looking forward to it as much as I am and you can pre-order it. The links are below and that's it for me. Thank you for watching.